Again, I want to welcome you in if you've just stepped in. And before I begin the message, I do want to ask us as a church, l- listen closely to this. I-, I do want to ask us to just please pray for Israel. And um, as you know, um, as you, you know my heart, you know, I get in trouble because I don't make enough political statements. I get more emails over, well, you didn't say the red state thing or you didn't say the blue state thing. I get more in trouble for that. You know, um, I just want us to pray for Israel and to pray for the peace of the gospel. Do you know the ultimate answer for peace is for the gospel to flood the earth? And so I want to... Um, but I want to ask you to pray for Israel because the Bible, you know, the Bible commands us to do that. Psalm 122 says, pray for the peace of Israel. And so let's do that. And the second reason is because of just the horrendous, the horrendous uh, outpouring of evil that has happened to them in these days. And so could I ask you to join me in praying for them? Father, I want to pray. I just want to pray for the people of Israel right now and the suffering that they're going through as a result of just the horrible acts of terror that they endured just one week ago. And God, I pray that you bring peace to that region. And Father, I pray that you're, you've already told us, it's not a secret, you don't have to dig this out of the Bible, it lays right on the surface, that the answer for peace in this world is the gospel to spread over the earth, to cover the earth. And that ultimately it is about Jesus coming and reigning over the earth and bringing a thousand years of peace. And God, we pray for peace today and we pray for ultimate peace, the peace of the gospel. And we pray that now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to jump into this message and I want us to prepare our heart, prepare our hearts for communing with Christ in the Lord's Supper. And so here's a challenge I want to work with you to overcome. Maybe you don't know this challenge is in you, but I I want to work with you for a moment to overcome a certain challenge. And you're not going to think it's a challenge when I say it, but it is. I want to work with you to overcome the challenge of seeing Jesus as real. To see him in literal terms. Not like we're reading about a folk hero in a classic novel that captures our imagination. I mean, be honest with your thoughts when you open the Gospels. And you read, you read about Jesus healing a blind man or expelling a demon out of someone possessed or touching a leper and their skin grows like a baby. I mean, do you think of those things as real and literally happening before your eyes? Or does your mind sort of unconsciously put Jesus in a category, you don't even realize you do it, but you kind of put Jesus in a category of not quite real. Maybe the stories about him are more inspirational than they are real. I I want to help you move him into the category of real in your own life, and I want to do that over the next several moments. So we're going to turn to a well-attested historical document in order to do it. We're going to turn to the gospel of Mark. Sometimes it's just helpful for us to realize before the gospel of Mark was placed in the Bible, the gospel of Mark was a standalone documentation of Jesus' life written within 30 years of the, uh, of the experiences of Jesus, an authentic biography of his life and teaching I mean, the church within 30 years of Jesus' life was passing Mark, the Gospel of Mark, around and reading it to know the life uh, of Jesus. We have more than 5,800 extant copies of the ancient document uh, of Mark. 
In fact, in, in fact, recently, just 2018, another fragment has been found that, uh, of a copy written within 100 years of its writing. And, and you know, I don't, that may not make a lot of difference to you, but if you were, if you were an expert in ancient text, you would say, that's huge. That, that, that qualifies this document as historically authentic and accurate. And we're going to read from it. We're going to read the reality of it about the real life of Jesus. Let's go there. It's Mark 14. I'm going to read about Jesus' experience in the moments immediately after he and his disciple leave, disciples leave the, the upper room after he takes the bread and cup. Then he takes them out. Verse 32 says, And they came to a place named Gethsemane. It was an olive grove on the Mount of Olives. Uh, scholars think that it was walled because it had an olive press. And, uh, and, it, and he takes them there and he says to his disciples, sit here until I've prayed. He takes, he takes you know, uh, I think nine of the 11, eight of the 11. He says, you guys sit here. And he takes three, James and, and John and Andrew, and says, Peter, James, and John, actually. Peter, James, and John said, come with me verse 33, and he began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to the three, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here with me and pray. And then he went a little beyond them, verse 35, and he fell to the ground and, and he began to pray that if it were possible that the hour, this hour might pass by him, pass him by. And he began saying, Abba, Papa, Father, all things are possible for you. Please remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. Verse 37, and he came and found, he prays that he came and found the three sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep praying for an hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and he prayed the, the same experience, saying the same words. Verse 40, and again, he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, uh, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time, and he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Verse 42, get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me. Uh, is at hand, and immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up uh, accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priest and the scribes and the elders, uh, and, and now he who was betraying him had given them a signal saying, whoever I kiss, kiss on the cheek, uh, he is the one, seize him and lead him away under guard. Verse 45, after coming, uh, Judas immediately went to him saying, Rabbi, and kissed him, and they laid hands on him and seized him. Now, I want you to follow an idea through this passage, and I want this idea to lead you to a, to a real communing with him in the moments ahead. Watch this idea. Follow this idea. I want you to see Jesus in reality, and I want you to see the reality in what he's done for you. And so he enters the Garden of Gethsemane for the last time. And we know about the Garden of Gethsemane in the life of Jesus. Uh, and, and there's a sense of reality around the Garden of Gethsemane of Jesus. I mean, there's a sense of reality of Jesus, not a fable, not a legend, a real man. Because, because the Garden shows us that Jesus had habits and routines. Luke 22 says it was Jesus' custom to go to the Mount of Olives where the Garden of Gethsemane was located. It was his custom to do so. When he was in Jerusalem, uh, he typically went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, I mean, how did Judas know days before Judas makes a deal with the chief priest as Jerusalem is filling up with pilgrims. He makes a deal with, chief, with the chief priest to take a bribe, 30 pieces of silver, and 
on, on the night before Passover, I can take your security guard. I can take them to the secret place that he will be. I mean, how did he know that Jesus would be there that night after supper a few days later? John 18 tells us that Jesus, that Judas knew it because Jesus often took his disciples there for prayer and rest. He had routines and habits. I mean, there's a reality in him. It shows his reality. I mean, those are not the kind of details written in ancient legends and fables. You just can't find that kind of habitual, habit-sorted, ha- habit sort of uh, a detail in legends and fables in the ancient world. It exposes, it expresses, this is reality. And his experience for the last time in the garden is going to show you his reality. What he symbolized earlier that evening with the bread and the cup, he's now going to make it a reality in his own experience. And I want you to see that unfold. And so look, prepare your heart for the Lord's table and how it ought to affect you. And so what are, what are, what's going to be our means? How are we going to affect our own hearts for the Lord's table? I want you to watch his reality and let that affect you as you take the Lord's table. And let's just see these realities. First of all, I want you to see the reality of Jesus' experience in the garden. So, see the reality of his experience. And that's happening in verses 33 and 34. He takes Peter and James and John, and and he takes them apart, and then he he begins to feel very distressed and troubled. And, And he says to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Please stay here and pray with me and for me. So see it in two ways. Just just this reality as real history. I'm trying to break through the fabulizing that we do in our own brain. The sort of legendary thinking we think of Jesus sometimes. Break through that and for you to see this is a real experience in the real Jesus life. Here's why Here's why it's important. Um, so, right, there's some people, uh, when they want to try to dismiss the New Testament, here's kind of a way they try to do that, to say it's not really authentic. Um, and they do it, why? Mostly because they don't want to have to deal with its claims on their life. And so, so you know, one of the easy attempts, it doesn't work, but one of the easy attempts is to say, well, you know, the New Testament is filled with a lot of legend material, and, and, and you can't even know if a lot of it even happened. That turns out to be a really bad argument. And here's why. In all ancient Greek, Roman, Jewish literature, they never let their folk heroes die like Jesus died. It's a complete anomaly. Uh, But not only that, they never even let their heroes face the prospect of death the way that Jesus encounters it in this passage. He's just way too vulnerable. He has way too many real emotions. There's no writing like this in the ancient world. Um, uh, Leonidas, the legendary leader of the 300 Spartans who sacrificed his life along with his fellow soldiers in order to hold off the army of thousands, the thousands of Persians. It's famous and it's written about in the ancient world over and over. And and when they write about it, uh, he faces his death with total courage and resolve and heroic self-sacrifice. That's what's typical. This is important. If you were a leader in the early church and you're making up a movement and you want Jesus to stand out in that movement, you want to get people to follow, in that culture, in that generation, you would never show him uh, being vulnerable to human emotions and feelings. I mean, it would be offensive to read. I mean, every Roman, Greek, or Jewish reader, uh, they they only wanted to see leaders who were impervious to those kind of emotions. 
So what's the explanation? I mean, the only possible explanation for in Mark writing this incident out like it's written out is that it must have actually happened that way because there's not a false motive that could legitimately explain it. And look, I know I'm just sort of touching the surface here and I'm just trying to sort of dig through, I'm trying to break through kind of a barrier in our culture that when we think of Jesus, we kind of think of him more in legendary terms and in, in fabulistic terms. I, I, I mean, the point is, you have to deal with the fact that there is a reality in Jesus and a reality in that he walked among us as the Son of God and a reality that he went, what he went through was real and what he said to us about himself and what he said to us about us is real and that the claims that he makes about how you come to him is real. But there's a second part of this, that, that this reality, this first reality is the reality of experience, not just historically, but in his actual experience. Now look at it. Now we get to the words. He began to be distressed and very troubled. Verse 34, and, and then he says, I am grieved to the point of death. Then verse 36, Father, everything is possible with you. Please remove this cup from me. I mean, Jesus is revealing an inner turmoil that's just raging in him with his three closest disciples. He uses these strong, volatile words about what he's going through. He's telling him, he's telling them, I'm so distressed, it feels like I'm going to die from it in this moment. That second word, troubled, it means to be overcome with horror. He's agonizing. He's struggling. He's asking them to pray, uh, pray with him. Uh, but but, but what, is, what is this agony? What's the agony that he feels? I mean, is it that, hey, I'm going to die? Well, Jesus knew, Jesus knew he was going to die from, the beginning, from the, the beginning of his life. I mean, from the beginning of his ministry, he told his disciples over and over and over and over and over, I'm going to, I've come here to die. He knows he's going to die. It's not the agony of that. There's a deeper agony, and what is it? I mean, in all of his earthly life, he never, he never, he never shown that he was troubled about anything. All of the 33 years and the three years of ministry. Shock, he's never shocked or overwhelmed by anything. I mean, what could this possibly be? It takes us to the second reality that I, I, I want us to see and feel. Not just the reality of his, of his experience, but then this one's going to be kind of shocking. This one's going to take a big turn, right? Get ready for it. I, just, I mean, what the garden shows us is another reality and a reality that just doesn't get talked about in the contemporary church uh, at all. And that is, I just want you to see the reality of God's wrath. Verses 35 and 36, he went a little beyond them. He fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, this hour might pass him by. And he uses the most intimate terms, Abba is Papa, Daddy. He's so intimately reaching out to the Father in heaven. I mean, you can do anything. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Now, let's put this in context. Let's put it in context. When Jesus lived among us, nothing ever threw him off. Nothing. I mean, there is this direct 40-day sustained frontal attack of the evil one, Satan, toward him individually, and he's unmoved by it. He had dangerous encounters with demon-possessed people. Most people would be afraid they would tear them apart. He's, he's unbothered by it. There are lots and lots of attempts to entrap him. Every, every time he went to Jerusalem, the, the Jewish leaders there tried to ask him these sort of trick questions that in their culture could get him executed. And he never bothered by those questions. Sent them, he sent them running in embarrassment. Uh, there were a couple of incidences where his preaching, <laughs> my preaching 
Well, my preaching has never made people this mad. I mean, sometimes it makes people mad, but, but th- there, there's a couple of incidences where his preaching so enraged his listeners, they were ready to execute him in the moment, and he just calmly walks through them. I'm giving you examples. He's just never bothered by anything. But what is this? Verse 36 Please remove this from me. He's desperately asking his father, please, if there's any way, I I don't want to go through this. I mean, what is it? I I mean, look, he's facing something way beyond the fear of physical death, way beyond some sort of physical torment. There's something much worse overcoming him, something that horrified him, um, and what is it? Well, verse 33 gives us sort of a key, and then, and then he tells us clearly in verse 36. Um, so it starts out saying that, that he began to experience something. The important word is he began. He comes into the garden. He calls his, his three closest disciples. And in that moment then, it says he began to experience something. He was beginning to get a taste of what he would go through on the cross. But it was much more than the physical pain or torment. He already knew he was going to do that. that, that's, That's all been clear. But what is it? What is it that is so horrifying to him? Well, he tells us when he prays, Father, remove this cup. Cup, what cup? It turns out that the cup is an Old Testament prophet's word for the deep wrath of God. Let me give you an example in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel's prophecy. This is just one of many, but but in Ezekiel's prophecy, he writes, he writes to his people, you will drink a cup of wrath, large and deep, full of ruin and and, and desolation, and you'll tear away at your chests. It always meant the deep wrath of God. I mean, what was Jesus beginning to taste in the garden? It was the sheer horror of the one who lived totally, he lived his life totally for the Father, who never even once felt what sin felt like. And now to have all of the Father's righteous wrath for all of sin to begin to drip out on him fully to be experienced on the cross. But he began to just get a taste of of what the wrath of God is and and, and why. What, What and why of the wrath of God? I mean, the wrath of God is the right punishment for sin. And ultimately, sin is just not wanting God's rulership over your life. It's to turn away, to go your own way, for you, for you to be separated from God. Do you realize his wrath is to be ultimately separated from him? To be utterly separated from him. And the experience of beginning to taste that separation for Jesus was more horrifying than any description of hell in the Bible. And you got to see this point. It was just a taste of it. I mean, if this was only a taste, what would the full experience of separation be for him when he, ha- when he hung on the cross? It just, look, it just takes us to, the, to the, these realities of God. Look, here's the God of reality, not the God fabulized or, legend, or, or made legend. Here, here's the God of, of, of reality. He loves you deep, uh, deeply. Gracefully, mercifully, mercifully, he pours out his love on you more than you can possibly imagine. And he hates everything evil. He hates what sin has done to every human heart. He hates how it destroys the beauty that he created in us. I'm going to take a chance here. So, be mature about this. Um, uh, if, if you've had the courage to read any 
of the individual stories coming out of southern Israel in the last few days. And you've read of the horror of it. Um, I just want you to do it for just a second and then dis dispatch it uh, only for a second. Think of the worst thing you read or the worst thing that you heard. Now, again, don't get off on some political, you know, mindset here. I just want to ask you a specific question about that incident. Do you want that kind of evil eradicated from humanity? Do you want the capacity for that kind of evil to be removed from our existence? And if the answer is yes, then you want the God that we actually have. Not the God of your imagination. You know, you know that trite thing, the God I serve is, and then you just kind of name what you want things to be. You know, the God of love that doesn't really care if sin grows up in me. We have the God who loves us so much that, that, that he will ultimately wipe the capacity for evil from the earth. And he loves you so much that he has sent his son, Jesus, to the garden and then to the cross to keep you from being wiped out with his wrath. Christ is taking on the punishment for all sin and bringing healing for everything broken in us. And out of sheer grace and mercy and love, he's offering you total forgiveness and full and undeserved mercy. If you put his faith, if you put your faith in what the real Jesus is about to do on the cross for you, die in your place. Uh, exchanging places with you, taking the punishment that you deserve for your sin so that you can have the life that he lives. And it moves us to the third, and it moves faster. There's the first two, seeing Jesus in reality, but I want you to see the third reality. It's not just his experience. It's not just seeing the reality of God's wrath, but then thirdly, to see the reality of your worth to him. This is phenomenal to me. Verses 41, it's going to follow. It, they come to the end of this time that he's in the garden, and Jesus calls it. He calls it. It's enough. Verse 41, it's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. They don't know what he's talking about. There's nothing going on in the garden. They're there by themselves. What do you mean? What, what do, you, do you even mean? Verse 42, get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Betray you? Where? There's nobody around us. Come on, follow me. And they start making their way out of the garden. And verse 46, they're encountered by the crowd. They're encountered by the mob. Verse 46, they laid hands on him and seized him. Here is Jesus walking into it, willingly giving himself. Why? But even more, why did God put him through what he put him through in the garden? Why did he do that? Do you know that's a, fa that's a famous question? Uh, that's a famous question, well-known question that I think comes originally from Jonathan Edwards. Everybody's like, or a lot of people are aware of it. Uh, and so the way he asked it is, why did God let Jesus see this and feel this and experience this before the cross? I mean, wasn't that dangerous? Wouldn't, uh, why wouldn't God just... I mean, it's so horrible. Why wouldn't God just wait until Jesus was secured on the cross and then, and then, show him all of the wrath of God? Why didn't God just wait until he was there? Why didn't God, why does God show that to him now? And then Edwards answers his own question, and he says, here's why it was so that we could see Jesus go to the cross willingly voluntarily knowing full well the depth of the horror that he was about to experience so that his love for us would be unmistakable to see. I mean, look, do you get it? Yeah, celebrate that. And Do you get it? I mean, what did Jesus have to gain? 
I mean, what did he have to gain by going for himself, going to the cross? I mean, he is in heaven. He is, Colossians 1 says he is first over everything. I mean, everything worships him. Everything in the universe worships him. He lives in splendor and majesty and power. I mean, why, what does he have to gain by coming here and dying on the cross when you've got everything? And there is only one answer. He did it. To gain you. The only thing he didn't have. He did it to gain you. How much value are you to him for him to lose everything, everything, in order to gain you? Man, you ought to feel you ought to feel the ultimate value of just who you are, your personhood. Because Christ went to that depth for you. And it was all real. I want you to bow with me, would you? Could we bow together? Doesn't that move you? Doesn't that change how you see him? Doesn't it move you to live a life that loves him most of all? That's what I want this next moment to be for you. Ever in the worship team is going to come and sing over you for a moment. And I want you to just open your heart to him. And just sense the reality of his experience in the garden, of what he was going through for you, the wrath of God, and your value to him. And let that speak to your heart and move you and cause you to surrender. Sing all to Jesus, I surrender. All to Jesus, I surrender. Humbly at his feet, I bow. The worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. I surrender. I surrender all. And I surrender all, all to Thee.
come to the Lord's table. And um, let me just give you some instruction. In a moment, our deacons will come and serve the bread and the cup to you. And so they're in trays and they're in a double cup. And so as they come and distribute that, if you'll just take a double cup out and hold on to it. We ultimately will take the elements together, so just hold on to it. You might want to try to separate the two uh, cups and be ready with the bread. And after everyone is served, I'll come back and um, I'll just lead us together as a community in communion with Christ to take each one of these um, elements. So I'm going to read uh, the First Corinthians Lord's Supper passage. We're going to pray, and then as the elements are distributed, I want to ask you to spend those moments just praying about your own life. It's what the passage tells you to do. And the moments should be filled with repentance and recommitment and, and giving thanks for what Jesus has done for you in the garden and on the cross and remembering that it is real. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after the supper and saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, what is that? It would be someone who is not a Christ follower participating in taking the elements. It would be a Christian, a Christ follower, who has no intention of repenting from what is in their life that is not pleasing to God, taking the bread and the cup. They shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. That's what these moments are. And in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Let's bow together. I'm going to ask our ushers, I mean our deacons, our deacons to come. And as we bow, Father, I pray that you make the experience of Jesus real to us in this moment. I pray, God, that you would help us see your righteous wrath is real in this moment. I pray that you would help us see the merciful forgiveness and grace poured out on us as real in this moment. I pray that you will help us see and feel the value you have for us by sending Christ for us. And we pray that now in Jesus' name. Amen. The bread of life Broken for all my sin Your body crucified To make me whole again I will recall the cup Poured out and sacrificed to trade the sinner's end for your new covenant and hallelujah I'll live my life in remembrance and I'll live Your promise. 
night before Jesus went to the cross, he lifted up the unleavened bread of the Passover and changed its meaning forever when he said, this is my body, meaning my body that's going to be slapped and beaten and shredded with a whip and then crucified for you. And then he said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Then at the end of the night, before they departed from, for the garden, the garden of Gethsemane, he lifted up the cup and he said, this represents a new covenant from God to all of humanity. It's a covenant of mercy and forgiveness and grace. And by the shedding of my blood, you will find forgiveness for all of your sin and a new kind of life in me. And then he said, drink from it, all of you. Let's worship together. I want to invite you to stand as we remember the sacrifice, as we remember what he's done for us. All we can say is, God, thank you because you've been so good to us. Thank you because you've been so good to me. Sing these words with me today. You've been so so good to me and you've been so so good to me oh to think where I would be oh to think where I would be if not for you if not for you you've been so good come on we sing you've been so so
lift our voices together and sing. You've been so, so good to me. You've been good. Yes, you've been so, so good. Oh, to think where I would be. And oh, to think where I would be. If not for you. If not, one last time, one last time. Let's sing those words. You've been good. Yes, you've been so, so good to me. Yes, you have. You've been so, so good to me. Oh, where would I be, Lord? Oh, to think where I would be if not for you, if not for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You've worshiped well. You've done well. And so, uh, hey, let me invite you to one of our prayer areas here at the back of the room. It says prayer at the back. If you have any any way you would like for someone to pray with you, if you're carrying anything, we'd love to pray for you. Number two, remember, hey, if, if you're open to finding a group, go to the lobby and say, help me find a group, and they would be happy to do that. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. You're dismissed. <laughs>